Hi, I'm Iona and I'm the editor of Bang This Term and I'm here with Dr Ellen Lestride, who is a biomedical engineer. Hello, I'm Dr Ellen Lestride. I work in engineering science, but I'm actually based in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, which is based up at the Churchill Hospital. So you work on engineering better drug delivery systems. Yeah. Can you tell me more about your research? Yes, of course. So although drug delivery seems a very, very long way from engineering, yeah. um, what we're really doing is vehicle design. We're developing means of getting drug to target areas within the body, actually where you need the drug to treat a particular disease, rather than just injecting into the whole body, which is what's normally done now. So one of those uh, is to use so-called microbubbles. Um, these are tiny, tiny capsules that contain both gas and, uh, in addition to the gas, we put the drug in a shell around the gas with something protective on the outside. What that does is it keeps the drug encapsulated in the bubble, travels throughout the bloodstream, and then when we reach a target site, we can release that drug using a variety of different methods. The one that we work on most is ultrasound, and the advantage of that is it's completely non-invasive. Uh, many people have had ultrasound scans in a hospital. We're using very similar technology, but just at slightly higher energies. We drive the bubbles with the ultrasound, this makes them expand and contract and eventually break open and then release the drug. In doing so, we manage to localise the area that the drug is released in and that reduces the risk of harmful side effects. So what exactly is wrong with current drug delivery methods? Uh, well, as I'm sure most people are aware, very powerful drugs, for example, those using cancer treatment, tend to be associated with the very um, unpleasant side effects, for example, hair loss, nausea. Um, what we want to do is to maximise the efficacy of the drug but remove those side effects. Okay. And the real problem um, with the way that drugs are currently given to patients is they tend to either be injected into the bloodstream or given in pill form. What that means is that if the drug goes throughout your entire body, all your cells are exposed to it rather than just the ones you're trying to treat. So normally bubbles in the bloodstream are not a good thing, like in things like the bends. So why are your bubbles special? Sorry, so the reason um, bubbles are dangerous in the bends is that they can be quite large and they formed in a completely uncontrolled manner. So if a diver's coming up from the bottom of the ocean, there's a big pressure change, bubbles form throughout the body. And if you're very unlucky or one of those bubbles ends up blocking a blood vessel, for example, supplying the brain or the heart yeah. somewhere crucial, that's extremely dangerous. So when we're manufacturing our microbubbles, we need to make sure they're very, very tiny. So they're smaller than the smallest blood vessel in the human body, which is a couple of micrometers typically. And we also coat them with something to keep them that size, stop them coalescing, uh, potentially causing a blockage. How do you guide the bubbles to where they're meant to be in the body? It's possible to coat the bubbles with something that will make them sticky to a particular type of cell. For example, cancer cells express certain proteins that you can target. That tends to be quite inefficient. Um, you can actually use ultrasound to drive the bubbles. Um, ultrasound is a wave, it's carrying momentum. You can use that to push the bubbles against the target site. One thing we're looking at is making the bubbles magnetic. So as well as having drug in the bubble coating, we also have magnetic particles, and that means that we can localise the bubbles just using an externally applied magnetic field. So how did you come up with the idea? What are the kind of stages of getting to these micro bubbles? Oh gosh, um, it's a very difficult question to answer. Obviously, we didn't invent, yeah. me and my team didn't invent the whole field at all. In fact, the fact that bubbles make fantastic contrast agents in ultrasound scanning was discovered by accident about 50 years ago. Someone was doing an ultrasound scan and noticed that when they did an injection, the scan got brighter. And they eventually figured out that was because very tiny bubbles were coming in with what they were injecting. Um, the idea of loading drugs also has actually been around for a very long time, although admittedly not into a bubble. Um, the idea of the magnetic microbubbles was something that I was standing next to a colleague at a conference. Uh, he had a poster on magnetic nanoparticles, I had a poster on bubbles, and we looked at each other and thought that would make an amazing combination. <laughs> so it was completely by chance. And so what material are your bubbles made of? Sure, so we use a variety. We try to use things that are either naturally present in the body or something that you regularly intake, so foodstuffs. Um, so the main material we use is the same substance on all your cells. Um, so it's a so-called phospholipid. Um, that's, you normally have a, a bilayer of that around all biological cells. We use that same material but in a monolayer form to coat our bubbles. But we also use proteins and um, some biopolymers as well, whatever we need to stabilise them and keep them for as long as we need. What kind of drugs would this be used for then? Uh, you mentioned cancer therapy, cancer therapy. So that's the one that we're mainly looking at at the moment, uh, so conventional chemotherapy drugs, um, 
dogs are reversing back attacks and these sorts of things. So they're already licensed for use. We're just trying to deliver them more effectively, and as I said, reducing side effects. But we're also looking at using this in um, gene therapy. Uh, so gene therapies got enormous potential for an awful lot of diseases, but at the moment there is this huge problem. It's very difficult to get your DNA or your cyRNA or whichever type of molecule you're trying to deliver to the right place. So we're hoping that that will also be useful for that too. What are the major problems you faced in this research into bubbles? Like what, <laughs> what are the biggest? Many, <laughs> all over the place. Um, so repeatability. Obviously, if we're trying to develop a new treatment, something we want to work in hospitals, we've got to be sure it going to work nearly 100% of the time. So making sure we do our experiments, they're absolutely repeatable. The way we manufacture the microbubbles is something that can be scaled up and actually taken into pharmaceutical companies. Things. So those are big practical problems. Um, and then the complexity of the processes that we're trying to use in the body are enormous. It's a very, very complicated system. So understanding how the bubbles are responding to ultrasound, how they're releasing the drug, and then how they're interacting with cells is very, very complicated, but we need to understand those yeah. to make sure that it's going to work. So what stage are you at currently with the research? We have lots of protocols for manufacturing the microbubbles. Um, we have some very promising data with cells, um, and also in small animal testing. Um, my colleagues are taking a sort of uh, a beta version, if you like, um, of ultrasound mediated delivery actually into the clinic this year. That's not using microbubbles, it's just using capsules, but we hope if that's successful, we'll then be able to integrate the bubbles into that move into clinical trials of something uh, with a, an already approved drug, hopefully within the next sort of two to three years. So when do you think we could see this being used in clinical settings? We very much hope within the next sort of five to ten years, um, certainly bubbles combined with drugs. The magnetic bubbles is going to take a little bit longer, um, but I'm certainly hoping within the span of my career that we'll see this really making a difference. Ooh. And what would be the next stage in this, what, after magnetic bubbles, what would you try to do? Or is that? Um, interesting question. We've got a lot of ideas, so at the moment we're focusing on bubbles. Um, one disadvantage of that is they're relatively large. I said they're really tiny, <laughs> but actually by, by the standards of the body they're quite small, um, quite large compared with cells, and they're quite large compared with the gaps in blood vessels. Sometimes to treat particularly uh, certain types of cancer tumour, you need to get your drug even further than the bubbles can transport it. So we're looking at scaling down to even smaller types of capsule, that are liquid, but then when we insonify them with ultrasound, they actually become bubbles. But they'll do that much, much deeper into the tissue. So that's probably where we're going next. So how do you make these tiny bubbles? How, like, what is the process of kind of manufacturing them? A number of different methods. Um, the industry standard, if you like, is not very far removed from taking washing up liquid and shaking it really hard. Um, that's very good. It gives you loads of bubbles very, very quickly. So it's very efficient but you do get a very broad range of bubble sizes, and if you're trying to encapsulate a drug, it's quite inefficient, you're not sure how much drug is in each bubble, so it's not great. So we've moved to looking at techniques using microfluidics and some other um, methods that allow you to actually make the bubbles one by one, um, which is fantastic because we can control the size, how much drug is in there, we can predict much better how they're going to behave, the trouble is they're a little bit slow, so one of the engineering challenges is actually taking these techniques and scaling them up. You studied my, my mechanical engineering, I did, right? yes. And um, what made you choose biomedical engineering? I'd love to think so I actually chose it. <laughs> I was doing my final year project on uh, ultrasound imaging, but actually in oil pipes. Um, so it was very conventional mechanical engineering at that stage. And we were looking at using bubbles as tracers to try and quantify how much oil and water uh, is in a pipe coming off an oil rig in the ocean. And my supervisor happened to meet a clinician who said they had some friends who were doing something very, very similar for ultrasound imaging. Um, and might I be interested in looking into that further? Uh, to which the answer was yes, absolutely. And that's how I ended up uh, where I am. How is biomedical engineering different to traditional engineering? In terms of what we do and the concepts, it's not different at all. We're using thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, um, basics, uh, you know, structural right. mechanics, all the same things that any other engineer would use. The only difference is the application. So rather than building cars or planes, we're building tiny drug delivery vehicles. But um, yeah, what the creativity and the mathematics and the physics is all the same. What's your favorite thing about engineering? Um, I think it's the satisfaction of solving a problem. Is that there's something that doesn't work currently or could work a lot better, and you actually have the opportunity to make that happen. 
So you do a, f a fair bit of science communication work. Um, have you always been interested in science communication and why do you think that's important? Again, it's not something I sort of deliberately got into. People wanted to know about what me and my research team do and I was delighted to tell them and it seems to have gone down quite well, so we're very keen to do more of that. And I think it is very important uh, for two reasons. One, people need to know why science is important. It's not just people in labs messing about. It is sometimes, but <laughs> you know, it really does have an impact on the world, particularly engineering. Um, and the other thing is that most people do think of engineering as being about building bridges and cars, which it is and is very important, but it's a lot broader than that. Um, engineering affects all areas of human life, really, and I think that's an important message to get across to. I think that's all the questions I have thought of, um, but if, is there anything else you want to say about your research or I can't think of anything, I think, that's covered everything <laughs> at this level. Uh, if anyone's interested, we have a website as well, so you're welcome to find out more about what we do there. Cool. Thank you.